So first off, it's about 300,000 miles. Um, <laughs> and I was actually talking to uh, Emily Robinson a couple days ago because I was having a panic attack about what's a good fact about me. Um, and I told her that fact is like, oh, I think I was going to use this. And she's like, oh, have you like done an analysis on that data in R? And I'm like, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, hi, I'm Jacqueline Dolis. Um, and look, it's the last talk of the day. I'm the one thing standing between you and alcohol. Like, I get it. <laughs> but um, and, and worse, you know, we're talking about deep learning. And deep learning is hard. But deep learning isn't hard, I promise. So we're going to start with the linear regression. Linear regression, that's not hard, right? We know what a linear regression is. A linear regression is you take some x's, you multiply them each by a coefficient, and you get a y. And you fit those coefficients, you get like a line thing. We've seen these charts before, hopefully. So that's a linear regression. We get that. But what's deep learning? And oh, and by the way, this presentation is going to be filled with some pets to just keep it nice, keep it comfortable. Last talk of the day, cute pets. So what's deep learning? Deep learning, it starts with these weird network charts you see all the time, right? You see these charts, they look complicated. You think, you can't do that. They're not linear regressions, they're weird dots and lines. But there's a trick. They're actually just linear regressions. <laughs> so deep learning, deep learning is powerful. Because really what you're doing is you're just taking a bunch of linear regressions and stringing them together. So each one of those top nodes is those same x's you were using in a linear regression. Each one of the middle nodes is a linear regression that each line says, feed those x's in. And so you have a row of linear regressions. You got three linear regressions. And the output of those gets fed into two more linear regressions, which gets fed into one more linear regression, which that output is y. And so it's still a bunch of linear regressions. So you can think about deep learning in many ways in the exact same way you would think about linear regressions. Now, in a linear regression, you do some stuff to fit that line. And in deep learning, you do a lot more to fit that line. But as someone who's using deep learning, you really don't have to think too much about that. So let's not worry about that. <laughs> and importantly, deep learning is funny. So here's some internet examples. Someone used deep learning to generate new D&D &D spells by feeding it old D&D spells. Someone made new Pokemon by feeding it the names of old existing Pokemon. And someone took, did a Freedom of Information Act on the state of Arizona to get all of the banned license plates that were too offensive and generated new offensive license plates on them. That person was me. <laughs> and so we learned earlier today, I keep leaning into this mic, but the mic's here. I don't know why I'm doing that. Um, we learned earlier today that deep learning can be used to like solve to find cures to diseases, but it can also be used if you desperately crave attention on the internet. <laughs> so what are we going to do? We're going to use deep learning in R. And there's one package that really helps us do it. It's called Keras. It's by R Studio. It's great. It's, it's really modern. It uses the tidy syntax that we're used to if you use the tidyverse. And actually, secretly, in the background, it's running Python. But you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Just don't, like, really, for like the beginner and intermediate project, that you don't have to think about that at all. Um, and importantly, it doesn't require an expensive computer. So when you hear people bragging about how many GPUs and millions of rows they had to do to get deep learning to work, know that you can do it on your five-year-old computer. <laughs> so our project is let's make some pet names. And we're going to do it using data from the city of Seattle. Oh, and by the way, these pet pictures are all from people in the R community who generously donated them. And we're going to take those names and get rid of them and put in some new funny names that uh, Deep Learning Network generated. And there's going to be some code that's discussed here, but all that code will be available, is available online. And you can see it. There's going to be a link again at the end of the talk, so don't worry too much if you don't get it right now. So what's the data? The data is years of pet license records from the city of Seattle. We only care about the name in this case. You could use the other sets of stuff, but we really care about the name. And we really want to learn the rules, right? So like, MR is probably Mr., so you follow it by a space, like the top name, Mr. Darcy. Um, there's lots of these rules that are hidden inside the names that we want the neural network to learn and use to generate new names. So the first step is we need to format the data. And just like a linear regression needs a matrix of x data and an output of y data, our neural network is going to need that too. And what we want to do is we want to predict for each like, part of the way through a name, we want to predict what the next letter is. So what we have to do is take all of the names that are in the database right now and decompose them into sets of each predicted next letter. And so you can see here, if we have the name spot, that we can actually create five data points for. We can try and predict what the starting letter is, which is the top row, to predict if you have five blanks, predict S. And then if you have four blanks and S, predict P. 
um, S and P predict O and so on and so forth. And then at the end point, you try and say S, P, O, T, spot will then predict the name is over. And so this will be the training data that we're going to use on our neural network. Um, and nothing to create, you have to create that data set, but nothing of that has to do with deep learning at all. That's just doing some data manipulation that you may have to do in other projects as well. So then we have to convert the letters to numbers. So just like a linear regression, deep learning can't reason in letters. You have to feed it in a set of numbers. So we're going to do two things. Well, we're going to do a lot of things, but two things first. <laughs> We're going to start by creating a dictionary. So we're going to say A is 1, B is 2, just like you were encoding a message to send to some friend when you were in high school to keep the teachers not noticing. Well, you, you, you code the letters as numbers. And then we're going to do one hot encoding. So we're going to say for each number, because we don't want like A to be close to B to be close to C, we want each one of these things to be independent, we're going to replace each number with a sequence of zeros and ones, well, uh, zeros with one one that's going to re represent the number. So 3 would be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and they'd be like, 25 zeros. And this is the same thing you would do in other places. Like if you're doing a linear regression on categorical data, you do the same thing. We're going to do that with our letters to turn them into a, set, a binary set of data. And so if we do those steps together, like blank blank SPO becomes a sequence of numbers, which then becomes a sequence of sequences of zeros and ones. And so that ends up meaning the input is a three-dimensional binary matrix. And the size is the number of training rows by the maximum length of our name, by the number of characters in our dictionary, i.e. 26, or like 27 if you include a space. And the target Y is a two-dimensional matrix, because we have the number of training rows and the number of possible characters the next character could be. OK, so we formatted that data. And now it's time to make the neural network. But how are we going to design that network? And I apologize. I know they said no questions during the talks. And that's a question, so I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to steal. Yeah. Um, and so in, <laughs> in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to take someone else's design for a neural network who's already solved that problem. Because we don't have to worry about that step because it's hard. Let's let someone else do that work. Before we get there, let's talk about what the different types of layers are. So here are four different types of layers that will show up in a neural, could show up in a neural network and will show up in our neural network. Spoiler alert. Um, so first off is the dense layer. So this is the layer that we saw at the beginning of the talk. And it just says that take everything you have in the previous layer, take all the outputs, and feed each one as an input into the next layer. So everything gets everything. The LSTM layer, um, this layer is really useful for when you're dealing with sequences of data. And the point of this is to actually care about the order that the data is showing up in. So whereas the dense kind of feeds everything to everything in a way that you know, doesn't, really, doesn't really care about the order, what the LSTM does is says take the first input, train some stuff on it, then pass that to the second, then take the second input, train some stuff on it, along with the, input, the output of the previous thing. And then take the third input, train some stuff on it, along with the output of the second thing. And you keep doing this. And this is really helpful because if you imagine that something like a name has sequen you know, sequential information in it, like the order of the letters really matters. And so this allows you to consider how the order of the letters will propagate through. And we have the option with the LSTM layer to either take each take all of the output from all of those bottom nodes, or only to care about the last one. The dropout, the third, um, the third type of layer, this is to deal with the fact that neural networks can overfit. So if you imagine, if we have all these linear regressions, linear regressions upon linear regressions, we're going to get a lot of parameters. And if we're not careful, especially if we don't have that much data, we're going to way overfit to our training stuff. Stuff, that's technical, cool. Um, <laughs> And so what a dropout layer does is it will remove some of the edges in there, and it will remove some of the data just to kind of force the network to avoid being overfitting to the training. And then lastly, the activation layer. This layer will apply a function across the values. So you can imagine you may want to say, ensure that all of the outputs add up to 1, or all the outputs have at least, or at least value of 0. You can apply functions with an activation layer to do that. So those are the tools we're going to use when we create our network. So here's, here's our network. Um, so it's, gonna st it's a very cute dog. When I saw the picture of the dog, I thought it was a stuffed animal at first because the ears, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so our network, it's going to start with um, our input data. So in this case, the input data is going to be whatever the previous letters were in the name. And then we're going to add an LSTM to try and figure out what are the sequential patterns in that name. Like what can we, what can we get from the sequences of the letters? 
And then we're going to say, take all of the outputs from all the LSTMs, and let's get into an LSTM again. Because we want to just see if there's like more patterns, more nuances, can we build upon each other? Now, you can imagine for more complex data, we could have like four or seven LSTM layers. And when people talk about deep learning, what they really mean is a neural network where you have enough layers that it's super complicated. Um, so I don't think this hits that yet, but I don't know. Um, so then the dropout layer, that's there to, again, to avoid overfitting. Because especially with this, this data set, it's big, but it's not so big that the neural network doesn't have a risk of overfitting. And so then we add a dense layer. And the dense layer here is really important. And it's really important because what we want to do is we want to predict for each possible letter what the probability is that that letter will be chosen next. So if you imagine there are, like let's say, 27 layers, letters, all the letters of the alphabet and a space. They're actually all the letters of the alphabet, a space, and a stop. You want to have an, a node for each one of those that shows what's the probability of that node being next. So we need this dense layer to force the network to give the number of outputs that we want for our particular Y data. Um, and so then lastly, once we have that dense layer, we then need an activation layer. And the activation layer is there to ensure that these are probabilities. So they need to add up to one, and they all need to be great, uh, at least zero. Uh, and so the activation layer is just there to apply that function. So let's go to some code. Um, so here, this is from the Keras package. So that top row is just specifying the input. And you can see we specified an input with the shape um, you don't have to tell it the number of rows because it infers that. So it's just the max length of the name and the number of characters in the dictionary. And then we have the output is all of the layers. And you can see that each one of these layers of text actually correlates exactly with one of the layers on the previous slide. We have two LSTMs. We have a dropout to avoid overfitting. We have a dense layer with the number of characters as the output to get the number of outputs we want. And then the activation of softmax to ensure everything is a probability that adds up to one. So that's our network. And then we use the model to put it all together. So that at the bottom says, create a model that has these inputs and outputs, and then compile it. And in the compilation step, you just specify, OK, well, what is the loss we want to use? So what, can, what do we consider a good prediction? And what is the optimizer we use? And the optimizer is how do we try and optimize the network? But you can always put Adam and not even worry about it, and that'll get you far for many months. So. So that just defines the neural network. We then actually have to train it. And so by that, I mean we actually have to feed it input data. All we've done so far in that last slide was specify what the, the structure of the network looks like. And so we have some choices. So this is the code over here. So we say we take the model, and then we fit it with the x and y data, and we specify the number of epics and the, number of, and the batch size. And when I started doing neural networks, this, this beguiled me. Um, and it turns out that you really just have two choices. One is for the epics. This means how many times you want to go through and fit that data. If there are 700,000 rows of pet names, how many times you want to look through all of those pet names and try and make your network more and more accurate? And the batch size is just how many rows you want to fit at once. Do you want to look at 64 pet names at a time, 128, 256? Um, so the answers are the number of epics. Um, you basically can watch how the network converges. And so long as you've given it, as long as you watch how much that converges and you've given it enough epics, you're probably fine. So just look at the gra output graphs. And then the batch size, for small and even medium-sized projects, this really doesn't matter. It only matters if you start doing the complex stuff with GPUs and all that. Like, you really don't have to worry about it. Just set it to 64, 108, 128, and you're probably fine. <laughs> and so then you train it. And this might take a while. Um, and so you'll get from our studio a cool output like this. And on the top, it's showing you the um, accuracy of the model. So it's getting more and more accurate over time. And on the bottom, you see the loss. It's, it's improving over and over. You have two different color lines because you can split between training and test data. But if you're dealing with pet names, it doesn't really matter if you have test data. It's fine. Whatever you do is good. <laughs> um, OK. So when you've done that, you're done. You save your work, and you can save your model. And unfortunately, you can't use like a built-in uh, base R saving thing because it's one of those weird Python issues. You actually have to use a separate function to save, but it's fine. Just save it as a model. Call it model.h5. Move on with your life. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so how do you use it? So you load up that model somewhere else. You take it into another function. And then you use predict, just like you would with a linear regression or some other R code. You just use predict, and you say the model, and then here's all the previous letter's data. And keep in mind that previous letter's data has to be formatted in zeros and ones, just like the training data was. So you've got to do a little bit of work to get that to work, but that's fine. 
And then for input letters, that prediction is going to return the probability of each letter being the next one in the name. So what's the probability that A is going to be next or F is going to be next? And so then you define a function that starts with a blank string, predicts the next letter, and then updates like your current name, and then predict the next letter after that and after that until you get to a stop character, and then your name is done. You could create one function to do that. And once you have a function to create one name, you can create a function to generate many names, like this one here at the bottom. Generate many names, where I say, here's the, the number of names, here's the model, here's the list of characters to use, and here's the max length of name, and then you get a lot of outputs. And so then you have that one function that you can run and get um, all the good stuff. And so with that, it's fun time. Um, so I'm going to leave this up for a second just because it's really fun to read. Just like, just breathe, take a moment, look at some weird pet names. These are all generated from a neural network. Um, none of these were names. I filtered out any name that actually showed up in the Seattle names. So these are all um, new, fresh material. Go name your pets. Um, <laughs> And so this is really cool, because now as a fun side project, you too can have created a, a, a function that will generate names. And this is really great, and you can run it on your laptop, and you feel really good about yourself, of like, oh, cool. You know, you feel really good about yourself. Oh, cool, I can run this, and I can see how these pet names look. But you may want to show your friends. You may want to make a website so that anyone in this audience can go look at those pet names. I'm not going to do that. I would never do that. But what if you could? And that's to be continued. Um, <laughs> so tomorrow morning, um, at this very conference, um, Heather Nolas will go through the, uh, the process of taking a function like that and actually putting it into a production state so that can be used as an API in a really cool way. Um, cool. So to wrap it up, so neural networks in R, they're really not hard. Um, it seems very, they, they seem very inaccessible, um, especially given all the talk of fancy things like GPUs and things like that. But they're not, like, you can do it with not that much setup. You can think about them as just like a super fancy linear regression, and like your reasoning should, in general, apply. Um, you don't have to, like, you see those weird network architectures, and you think, how do I come up with what those are? And the answer is you don't. You steal other people's to start. <laughs> and then eventually, after you do it enough times, you'll start to be like, wait, I'm going to take this part from this network and this from this and start mashing it together. And while it is, you know, people talk a lot about the GPU powers and all the cool stuff you can do with um, more of the advanced technology and cloud and stuff, like, you don't have to do that. You can run it on your laptop to start. It's totally cool. Um, so here are some barks to action. Uh, so that's where you can, <laughs> that's where you can view the code. Um, it's an open source repository. It's great. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at SkyTetra, and I will have these slides available at some point in the near future um, on Twitter. Um, you can also go to nolasllc.com. You may not believe this, but I consult professionally for companies. Um, <laughs> some of them pay me. Um, and if you want to pay me too, um, or uh, my wife Heather, who also co-founded the company, we together uh, provide all sorts of professional consulting uh, services. Um, so please check our website out. And thanks to T-Mobile and our studio for a lot of the code that this talk was based on. Oh, I guess I